Hello everyone and Namaskar. Today's podcast is a continuation of the book titled Anandamurti, the Jamalpur Years. And this is a reading of the fifth chapter titled The Early Disciples. Turn your mind through spiritual practice and God will appear like butter from cream. He is like a subterranean river in you. Remove the sands of the mind and you will find the clear, cool waters within. Pranay Kumar Chatterjee was a short, slender, highly intelligent 22-year-old when he joined the Jamalpur Railway Workshop Accounts Department on June 2, 1947, two months and 13 days before India attained its independence from Britain. He was also a confirmed skeptic who put his faith in science rather than in what he viewed as the religious superstitions of his culture. That morning, his supervisor introduced him to the people he would be working with, including Pravat, whose desk was directly opposite his. At 11.30, Pranay broke for lunch, along with the rest of his new colleagues. As he started opening his tiffin box, he noticed a crowd gathering around Pravat's desk. Curious, he turned to the person beside him and asked him what was going on. Don't you know? His co-worker replied in a hushed tone. Pravada is a great scholar. He can read your palm and tell your future. True to his nature, Pranay's initial reaction was one of outright skepticism. What would a great scholar be doing working as an accounts clerk? in Jamalpur, for 40-odd rupees a month. As he ate the rice and curried vegetables that his mother had packed for him, he watched the scene with interest. He noticed the deference with which the other office workers treated Pravat. Finally, his curiosity got the better of him. When he was done eating, he crept up to the edge of the crowd. He watched Pravat examine the palm of one of his colleagues and listened to the advice he gave. He found it fascinating. But at the same time, he felt uncomfortable with the whole idea of fortune-telling, especially in the workplace. It seemed indicative to him of what he vaguely felt was holding his country back. On the other hand, he thought, it couldn't hurt to give it a try. A few minutes later, he got his opportunity. Pranay approached Pravat and asked him if he would read his palm also. Pravat looked at him momentarily, a slight smile on his lips, and then motioned wordlessly for Pranay to hold out his hand. The moment Pravat touched his hand, Pranay was startled to feel a pleasant sensation pass through his body, almost like a mild electric shock. But just as suddenly, Pravat closed Pranay's hand and turned to speak with someone else. How rude of him, Pranay thought, to turn away like that without even having the courtesy to say so much as a single word. He went back to his desk, mildly irritated, and resolved to have nothing more to do with Pravat, whom he suspected of being some kind of a charlatan. Over the next couple of days, however, Pranay grew more and more preoccupied. Both his parents and grandparents were devout Hindus. His father, in fact, was a Brahmin priest from Bengal. And despite his youthful reaction to what he considered their blind faith and dogmatic beliefs, he was not entirely able to escape the effects of his upbringing. What had Pravat seen in his hand that he refused to divulge What if there was some disaster looming up ahead? Though Pranay prided himself on his rational approach to life, he was unable to dismiss these nagging worries from his mind. A couple of days later, Pranay saw Pravat standing alone in a secluded corner of the office veranda. Taking advantage of the opportunity, he reminded his colleague that he had shown him his palm a couple of days earlier. 
Was there something you saw on my hand that you didn't want to tell me, he asked. Pravat's mood turned grave. Do you really want to know? Yes, please. As you wish. Meet me at the reading room about 7.30. We can talk then. When Pranay entered the railway library reading room that evening, he saw Pravat sitting at a table, flipping rapidly through the pages of the English newspaper. The Hindi and Bengali papers were lying open in front of him. They greeted each other, and Pravat asked him if he would like to go for a walk. On their way out, Pranay asked Pravat if he had been looking at the headlines. Pravat smiled. No, I read the articles. You can ask me about them if you like. Pranay thought he detected a subtle challenge. He remembered a couple of articles he had read earlier in the day and formulated several questions. To his surprise, Pravat answered them with such precision that it appeared as if he were quoting verbatim from the articles. The two men headed up the spacious boulevard that ran alongside the rear wall of the railway compound. From there, they turned onto another boulevard that led to the fields outside of town. It was a clear, late summer night with enough of a breeze to dispel the last of the daytime heat. As they walked, Prabhat began narrating the history of Pranay's birthplace, Bagalpur. The conversation moved on to different subjects, geography, language, culture, botany, astronomy, flowing effortlessly from one to another like water around the bend. The more Pranay listened, the more the debt of Pravat's knowledge amazed him. It was no wonder his colleague had called him a great scholar, he thought. He seemed more widely read than any person he had ever met. The one subject, however, that Pravat did not touch upon was his palm. Pranay was too polite to interrupt. But as the evening wore on and the two men went further and further afield, he began to lose patience. They had been walking for well over an hour when he finally blurted out that this was all well and good, but he had come there to find out what Pravat had seen in his palm. Pravat halted and fixed his gaze on Pranay, who immediately felt disconcerted. Do you really want to know, Pravat asked, after several moments' pause. Of course, that's why I'm here. Very well, then. Pravat resumed walking. Tell me, what is the aim of your life? Be happy, Pranay said. Laugh and make merry. Pravat laughed out loud. Your thinking is defective, Pranay. I can see that you are headed toward a great abyss. If you continue on this path, you are going to fall. Pranay shuddered. He reminded himself that he didn't believe in fortune tellers, but he couldn't help but feel apprehensive. Is there anything I can do to prevent it, he asked. I feel pity for you, Pranay. Let me think over the matter. Why don't you meet me again tomorrow evening at the same time? The 24 hours leading up to their next walk did little to lessen Pranay's anxiety. Again they met at the reading room and headed towards the fields. Again Pravat talked without making any mention of Pranay's future. But this time, when they reached the tiger's grave, Pravat stopped and sat down. He pulled a piece of paper from his pocket and handed it to Pranay. This is a Dhyan mantra of Shiva. Practice it faithfully each morning, according to my instructions, and you'll escape the calamity that is waiting for you. Pranay looked at the mantra with the aid of his flashlight and tried to hide his disappointment as he listened to Pravat's instructions. He disliked anything to do with the Hindu gods and goddesses. The last thing he wanted was to practice a Hindu ritual with a mantra to the god Shiva. But rather than be impolite, he thanked Prabhat for his help and promised to practice it. Over the next couple of days, 
he made a few half-hearted attempts to use the mantra as Pravar had taught him. But he couldn't bring himself to put any faith into his practice. On the third day, when he went to work, he found Pravat waiting for him outside the office entrance. Scoundrel, worthless chap, disrespecting a sacred mantra after you had promised to practice it sincerely. If you are not going to practice it properly, then give me back the mantra. Pranay was taken aback by Pravat's harsh tone and even harsher words. He apologized and asked Pravat how he had known. A sadhu with matted locks and a long beard told me. Pravat's remark puzzled him, but he felt a sense of relief. At least he wouldn't have to practice the mantra any longer. He asked Pravat what he meant by returning the mantra. Take the piece of paper I gave you and immerse it in water, either in a pond or in a river. Pranay did as he was told. That evening, he dropped a slip of paper with the mantra into a small pond near his quarters. He was glad to see it go, but his sense of relief did not last long. Soon he found himself listening to Pravat's lunch hour conversations with avid interest. His earlier resolution to avoid him forgotten. He remembered fondly how much he had enjoyed the conversation of his enigmatic colleague during their two evening walks. One day, Pranay approached Pravat during work and asked him if it would be possible to accompany him on his walk some evening. Pravat readily agreed, and the invitation soon turned into a regular custom. Pravat would leave his house around 7.30 each evening after completing his spiritual practices and would return around 10 or 10.30. Pranay accompanied him whenever he could. As time passed, he grew more and more attached to Pravat's company. No matter what the subject, the depth of Pravat's knowledge seemed fathomless. Soon Pranay began seeking Pravat's advice for personal matters, just as his co-workers did. Although he never again showed him his palm, he became so charmed by his eloquent companion that those evening walks soon became the main attraction of his life in Jamalpur. There was no branch of human knowledge outside the scope of Pravat's interest. But the one subject he returned to more than any other was spirituality. And it was this subject that Pranay liked the least. He listened patiently, sometimes even with interest but he felt uncomfortable talking about things he did not feel and could not see. From time to time, Pranay would reiterate that the object of his life was to enjoy like the people of America and England. This is just the umbra and penumbra of enjoyment, Pravat would say, like a dog whose mouth bleeds when it chews on a dry bone and thinks that it's enjoying a tasty delicacy, when in fact, it is its own blood that it is tasting. Pranay argued with him, but as time passed, the questions Pravat posed, the riddles to the mystery of human life, sunk into his psyche and began to demand more and more of his attention. 1948 gave way to 1949. India attained its freedom. The work of building the new Indian Republic got underway. Everything seemed possible in the afterglow of independence. But despite the general optimism in the air, Pranay became more and more aware of a growing emptiness within him. One morning in early August, while he was seated at his desk, he felt his despair overcome him. He sat there despondently, without attending to his work, absorbed in his thoughts. After some time, Pravat got up from his desk and walked over him. What's the matter with you? he asked. Oh, nothing, Pranay replied, jolted from his thoughts. Pravat's next words were in Sanskrit. Please, Pravat da, Pranay said. I don't understand what you're saying. Pravat reached out and tapped Pranay between the eyebrows at the Trikuti. 
Startled, Pranay looked at Prabhat and saw light flash from his eyes, like a sudden bolt of lightning. An electric current passed through his body, like a shock from a high voltage wire, followed by a wave of bliss. Prabhat turned around and walked back to his desk, returning to his paperwork as if nothing had happened. Pranay's heart began to palpitate. For a few moments, he felt as if he might be going mad. As he stared across the room at Pravat, he felt his long resistance give way. There must be some spiritual truth that I cannot perceive, he thought. Tears welling in his eyes. I am just groping in the dark. Unless I can reach that light, my life has no meaning. I must have the shelter of some great man who can guide me. His decision made, he got up and went over to Pravat's desk, where he bent down to touch his friend's feet. I surrender, Pravat Da. Please guide me. Accept me as your disciple. Pravat smiled and said softly, Very well then. Come to the field tonight. We'll talk there. That evening, Pravat took Pranay directly to the tiger's grave and initiated him into the practice of tantric meditation. He also gave him some yoga postures and dietary restrictions. During his initiation, Pranay felt a powerful, indescribable vibration that he was unable to comprehend, even stronger than what he had felt in the office. When he returned home that night, he couldn't sleep. He kept reliving the day's events over and over again. The mysterious flash of light, his surrender to Pravat, his initiation in the field, and the vibration he felt there. He kept asking himself what manner of man this was who could do such things. But he was unable to find an answer. When he arrived at the office the next morning, Pravat asked him to come to the field again that night. He had something more to teach him. That night, when the two men reached the lamppost by the covert at the edge of the field, Pravat stopped and took a piece of paper from his pocket. He handed it to Pranay. This is Yama and Yama, the Ten Principles of Yoga Ethics. As a spiritual practitioner, you will have to follow Yama and Yama very strictly. Pranay read what Pravat had written. Pravat, these rules are for sadhus in the forest, he objected. It is not possible to follow all of them in modern society. What are you saying? Pravat raised his finger and said in a commanding voice. You will have to follow them. You will have to follow them. Suddenly, Pranay found himself encircled by numerous images of Pravat each of them admonishing him with the same upraised finger. The sound of, you will have to follow them, you will have to follow them, reverberated in his ears like a series of echoes. He threw up his hands. Okay, Pravata, okay, I promise, I will do as you say. As he said this, the multiple images of Pravat vanished. Pravat's voice softened. Come, let us walk. They walked to the tiger's grave, where Pravat gave Pranay his second lesson, the Guru Mantra. It was shortly after eight when they finished. Pranay, it seems that you didn't sleep last night. You look tired. You are right, Pravat Da. I couldn't sleep at all. Come, put your head in my lap and rest for a while. Pranay lay down on the grave with his head in Pravat's lap, and quickly fell asleep. It was after midnight when he woke up to the sound of Pravat's voice. Hey, wake up. This is no time to be sleeping. We have to work tomorrow. They walked back to town in silence. Pranay hastened to keep up with Pravat's rapid pace. Feeling as if he were following, in his own words, the monarch of the universe. Years afterward, as an old man, he would claim that never in his long life had he enjoyed such a restful sleep 
as he had that evening on the tiger's grave with his head in the master's lap. Since Pravat never allowed any contact between his later disciples and those he had initiated during the previous decade, Pranay would become Pravat's first publicly recognized disciple, the first among those who would take active part in the spiritual organization he would later found. For the time being, however, a veil of secrecy was still in place. Pravat gave Pranay strict instructions not to disclose his identity to anyone. As a result, Pranay could not know for sure who his fellow disciples were, or if he even had any. The thought that he might be the only disciple made him uneasy, so he started watching out for the signs that someone else might be following his secretive master. In time, he noticed distinct changes in behavior in certain colleagues. An irreverent or coarse nature turning courteous and thoughtful. Lifelong carnivores, inexplicably giving up meat. Rumors of co-workers locking themselves in their rooms at home for some secret practice. He would think, ah, another one has fallen into the trap. But he couldn't ask them to confirm his suspicions without violating his guru's command. The next person who Pravar initiated appears to have been Haraprasad Haudar, another young Bengali, a few years older than Pranay, who worked as a draftsman in the mechanical section. One day, Haraprasad stopped by the accounts department to talk with a friend who worked there. Pravat called him over to his desk to inquire about an accounts clerk living in Haraprasad's boarding house, who was absent from work that day. Haraprasad knew who Pravat was, though he had never spoken to him. While Pravat was inquiring about his roommate, Haraprasad noticed that he was staring intently at his forehead. Aware of Pravat's reputation, he asked him what he was looking at. It's nothing, Pravat said. Anyhow, whatever is past is past. Better not to think about it. Haraprasad suddenly felt queasy. No, please tell me. You are preoccupied with three things in your life. I will tell you the first two. But the third, I'll only disclose at a later date. Pravat described with uncanny accuracy two of Haraprasad's three main concerns in life. Then he shocked him by declaring that Haraprasad was destined to have a short lifespan and that the date marked for his death was fast approaching. Haraprasad was too unnerved to say anything in reply. Don't worry about it, Pravat continued, as if what he was saying were the most natural thing in the world. Now that you have come in my contact, this can be changed. I will take care of it. You will meet me at the tiger's grave one month from today, in the evening around eight. We will talk then. Haraprasad was badly shaken by this encounter, but he did his best not to let it affect him. He was aware of Pravat's reputed ability to foretell the future, though he did not trust what he had said. He told himself that should this be his fate, he was ready to face it. Nor did he believe for a moment that Pravat had the power to alter his destiny, whatever it might be. But despite his best efforts to dismiss what Pravat had told him, the specter of his possible death continued to plague his mind. He wrote a letter to a close friend, Suken Naik, in his hometown of Krishnanagar, disclosing Pravat's prophecy. When Suken showed the letter to Haraprasad's father, his father sent Suken and Haraprasad's cousin to Jamalpur to console him and keep him away from Pravat. The man is undoubtedly a tantric, his cousin told him when they arrived. Stay away from him and everything will be okay. Haraprasad took their counsel to heart, but destiny had other plans for him. On May 18, 1950, exactly one month after Parvar had told him that he would meet him at the tiger's grave, he went to the railway library in the evening. As he entered the reading room, 
he saw Prabhat sitting at a table, reading the newspaper. The sight stirred up the fears of death he had done his best to put out of his mind. Anxious to avoid another encounter with the man who was the source of his anxiety, he left hurriedly, hoping that Prabhat had not noticed him. Preoccupied, he walked for some time without paying attention to where he was going. A short while later, he was startled by a voice calling him by the name from the tiger's grave, where he had unwittingly wandered. The voice belonged to Pravat, who wasted no time in reminding him of what he had forgotten, that he had told him one month earlier that they would meet again on this night, at this time, and in this place. Uneasy, but resigned to the encounter, Haraprasad allowed Pravat to lead him to a grassy area near the tiger's grave, where the three palm trees formed an equilateral triangle. Pravat removed his shoes before entering. Haraprasad followed suit, and the two men sat down on the grass, facing each other. On a later occasion, Pravat would explain to him the significance of that spot. A spiritually charged site, known as a Tantrapita, where the Nath Yogi, Pravir Nath, had achieved enlightenment, and where many other saints had come to do their spiritual practices. Now tell me, Haraprasar, why do you have such a strong desire to follow the spiritual path? It was the third thing that had been dominating his thoughts for the past couple of years, something he had not shared with anyone. He had, in fact, secretly began practicing certain yogic techniques that he had learned from a book. To his astonishment, Prabhat mentioned the practices he was doing and cautioned him that they should not be done without a proper guide. Prabhat went to explain the inner significance of the Bhagavad Gita, the classical Hindu scripture that is revered in India as a seminal yogic text. Prabhat's explanation cleared up many of Haraprasad's doubts about the Gita. When Prabhat was done, Haraprasad finally gathered the courage to ask him about his death. That is your destiny, but your destiny can be changed. How, he implored, what can I do? Please help me. He reached down and grabbed hold of Prabhat's feet in the traditional Indian gesture of respect for one's elders and teachers. You will have to practice the meditation I teach you. Do asanas according to my instructions and not out of a book and you will have to give up non-vegetarian food. Hara Prasad readily agreed. First of all, Prabhat continued, you have to give up any caste feeling you might have. God has no caste. We are all children of the Supreme Father. If you accept the Lord as your Supreme Father and the goal of your meditation, then you must accept that all creatures are His children with equal rights to His blessings. There can be no caste distinction between them. Now sit in lotus posture and remove your sacred thread. Haraprasad's misgivings mounted. Here I am, he thought, in this lonely place with a tantric. As long as I am wearing my sacred thread, he can't harm me. But if I remove it, I will be at his mercy. I give you my word, he said. I will take it off but not here, not now. Prabhat tried to reason with him, but Hara Prasad continued to resist. An edge crept into Prabhat's voice. What nonsense you are thinking. Prabhat reached out and touched him on his forehead. Hara Prasad felt an electric current pass through his body and in its wake, a feeling of intense bliss. All his doubts and suspicions vanished. Without any hesitation, he took off his sacred thread and placed it in Prabhat's hands. Prabhat chanted some mantras and threw it away. When he initiated him into meditation and asked Hara Prasad to practice a technique in front of him, within a few minutes, Hara Prasad entered into such a state of bliss that he lost all sense of time and place. After he came out of his meditation, he remained in an intoxicated state. As they walked back to town, everything around him, the fields, the trees, the nearby hills, 
the distant lights from town appeared to him as an expression of God, and he himself was also God. Pravara accompanied him to his boarding house, where his roommates were asleep. They had left some dinner for him, but Hara Prasad had no appetite. After he said goodbye to Pravat, he went up to the roof and remained there for the rest of the night, sometimes meditating, sometimes pacing back and forth in his God-intoxicated state. In the morning, Hara Prasad seemed to be lost in a daze, unable to talk, unable or unwilling to touch any food. His roommates didn't know what to make of his strange condition. They were afraid that he might have contracted some unknown illness. They counseled him to take rest in the hope that after a day or two, he would come back to his senses. But as the days passed, his condition showed little sign of abating. That weekend, a neighbor invited the residents of the boarding house to a Satya Narayana worship. They tried to convince Haraprasad to accompany them, but he told them that he himself was Lord Narayana. He would accept their worship from the boarding house. While they were out, Pravat dropped by to check on his new disciple. They went up to the roof to talk, and Pravat asked him if he were undergoing any difficulties. No, no difficulties, only bliss. The only problem I have is people coming and disturbing me. Don't worry, as long as I am here, we won't be disturbed. Pravat touched him on the forehead, and Hara Prasad felt the same electric current, an intense bliss that he had experienced during his initiation. When he came back to his normal senses, Pravat gave him his second lesson and then left. When his roommates came back, they found that Hara Prasad's condition had worsened. They asked the cook if anything had happened while they had been gone. The cook told them that a man had stopped by and talked with Hara Prasad on the roof for quite some time. This fired their suspicions, but they could not be sure of the man's identity. Not knowing what else to do, they contacted Hara Prasad's family, who came and brought him back to Krishnagar. He remained there for one month on leave, during which time he gradually came back to normalcy, though the blissful sense of God's presence continued. After Hara Prasad returned to Jamalpur, his roommates discovered that he was spending time with Pravat, sometimes walking alone with him at night in the field. They became convinced that Pravat had put some sort of tantric spell on their companion and suspected that he was teaching him strange occult practices. After some discussion, they decided to teach Pravat a lesson. One of them, Sadan Dei, had earned a reputation as a tough character that no one wanted to tangle with. Sadan bowed to catch Pravat alone and frighten him to the point that he would never bother Hara Prasad again. Sadan made some discreet inquiries about Pravat's nighttime walks. One evening, he slipped a dagger into his pocket and waited for Pravat near Jubilee Well, knowing that he would pass there on his way to the field. Sadan's plan was to follow a safe distance behind and then catch him alone when he reached the solitary areas outside of town. But to his surprise, Pravat called out his name as he passed by the well and went up to him like he was greeting an old friend, though the two had never formally met. Pravat invited Sadan to accompany him on his walk. Unsure what to do, Sadan agreed. As they headed for the field, Pravat inquired about each of his family members by name, back to his great-grandparents. Pravat asked him about his native village in East Bengal and chatted about the dialect prevailing there and other familiar matters with such disarming charm that Sadan found himself falling under the spell of Pravat's personality. As they walked, he became uncomfortably aware of the dagger in his pocket. Every time Pravat drew close to him, he fidgeted nervously, afraid that Pravat might accidentally brush up against him and become aware of the hidden knife. Several times, 
Bravat smiled and asked him why he was fidgeting. Michoni made him more nervous. When he reached the tiger's grave, Bravat suggested they sit. Sadan, he said, why don't you take the dagger out of your pocket? Sadan's face became flushed. What are you talking about? Take the dagger out of your pocket now. Sadan's bravado failed him. He hesitated a moment longer and then took out the dagger. Put it down on the grave. Sadan obeyed and laid it on the grave beside him. Bravat's tone softened. Sadan, you and your fellows are laboring under a misconception. There is nothing the matter with Hara Prasar. I have taught him yogic meditation. That's all. You would do well to practice it yourself. Bravat explained to him the benefits of yogic practice and cleared up his misunderstandings. Finally, Sadan agreed to learn meditation. After receiving initiation, he meditated for a few minutes in front of Pravat. He too felt something of the intoxication that Haraprasar had felt. When he reached his boarding house, his companions, who had been waiting anxiously for his return, found him radically changed. Afterward, Sadan and Hara Prasad started practicing meditation together. They accompanied Pravat on his evening walks whenever they got his permission. Thereafter, their roommates gave up their efforts and abandoned Hara Prasad and Sadan to their strange new life. One by one, Pravat quietly initiated new disciples among his fellow railway employees, always maintaining the strict code of secrecy that prevented them from knowing who their fellow disciples were. But soon, a chain of initiations began that would extend Pravat's circle of initiates outside of Jamalpur. It began with a childhood friend, Shiva Shankar Banerjee, who had grown up in the same neighborhood in Keshavpur. Sometime in 1951, Shiva Shankar came back to Jamalpur to visit his family. Taking a couple weeks' leave from his post as a police sub inspector. At the time, he was suffering from severe respiratory problems. He had seen a number of different doctors and tried different remedies, but could not get any relief from his ailment. As a result, he had become severely depressed. Shortly after he arrived in Jamalpur, he saw his childhood friend walking in the street in front of his house. The two men greeted each other and started catching up on old times. When Pravar inquired about his health, Shiva Shankar related his problems and expressed his despair of ever finding a cure. I know how to cure your illness, Pravat said. There is a practice I can teach you, but I can only teach you if you agree to certain conditions. I'm not sure you'll like them. You have to tell me, Shiva Shankar replied suddenly hopeful. This is ruining my life. I'm ready to try anything, anything at all, as long as it works. I'll teach you, Prabhat said, but you'll have to accept me as your guru. Are you willing to do that? Shiva Shankar was surprised to hear that his friend had become a guru, but he was desperate to find some kind of relief from his condition. If it works, then I'm ready, he said. It will work. Prabhat brought him to his room where he taught him meditation and a specific pranayama technique, as well as some yoga postures. He prescribed a change in diet and a medicine made from dissolving the leaves of a certain plant in unboiled milk. Shiva Shankar practiced the techniques faithfully and took the medicine. By the end of his leave, he was thrilled to find that his chronic, and hitherto incurable condition had seemingly disappeared. Before returning to his post, he thanked Pravat for what he considered a miracle cure and told him that he was ready to look upon him as his guru. Pravat gave him a second lesson and detailed instructions regarding his conduct and practices. When Shiva Shankar left Jamalpur and returned to his post in Sahib Ganj, he brought Pravat's teachings with him, 
including strict adherence to the yoga code of ethics, Yama Niyama. But as he settled back into his life as a policeman, he found it increasingly difficult to follow his guru's instructions. Corruption was endemic at his post, as it was in almost all areas of public service at that time. When it became clear to his colleagues that he was no longer willing to accept bribes or to look the other way in the face of his fellow officers' improprieties, he began facing strong opposition and veiled threats. Determined to follow Pravat's instructions, he applied for a transfer to a small outpost in the Bihar Military Police in the hopes that in a small and unenviable outpost he would be free to lead a principled life. His request for a transfer was granted in late 1952, and he soon found himself in Dumka under the command of a 35-year-old Sergeant Major, Chandranath Kumar. When Chandranath received the news that a sub-inspector from a prominent station in the Sabhiv Ganj colliery belt had requested and received the transfer to Dumka, the sergeant major became suspicious. Generous monthly bribes were counted on a regular addition to one salary in the colliery belt. Hence, such a transfer was unheard of. Chandranath was one of those rare officers in the BMP who followed the strict code of ethics and paid scrupulous attention to his duties. Tall, lean, and athletic, with an acute sense of honor, he had been raised in the countryside by a disciplinarian father who had taught him to appreciate the value of a simple and straightforward life. When the new officer arrived, he kept alert of any signs of dereliction of duty, bad character, or other shortcomings that might have forced him to request a transfer. What he found instead was a man of exemplary conduct who impressed him in every aspect of his professional and personal life. Intrigued, he finally asked him why he had put in a request for a transfer. When he heard Shiva Shankar's story, Chandranath felt a surge of inspiration he had been in search of a spiritual master himself for several years. During that time, he had met a number of gurus without feeling drawn to any of them. Until he finally met a saint in his own native village of Gadapur, who greatly impressed him. But when he requested initiation, the saint refused. Instead, he assured Chandranath, You will get it when the time comes. Now, a year later, Chandranath had a sudden premonition that his time had come. He told Shiva Shankar that he wanted to meet the man responsible for such a transformation. But he was disappointed to hear that Shiva Shankar's guru did not allow his identity or whereabouts to be disclosed. The best Shiva Shankar could do would be to present his request at the next opportunity and await his master's response. Chandranath wasted no time. He granted his subordinate immediate leave to visit his master and waited impatiently until his return two days later. His request was granted and the date and time fixed for him to come to Jamalpur. When Chandranath arrived at Pravat's house, Manas was seated on the porch. Manas ushered him into the front room and then went through a curtain doorway to inform his brother that someone had come to meet him. From the other side of the curtain, Chandranath heard a voice say, Has the time come? Echoing precisely the words of the saint from his village. A few seconds later, Bravat passed through the doorway and pulled up a chair for Chandranath next to the wooden cot where he normally sat when he received guests. After Chandranath introduced himself, Bravat told him politely, that he could ask whatever questions he wished. He would do his best to answer them. I haven't come with any questions, Chandranath said. I have come for spiritual initiation. Are you sure? Pravat asked. 
Yes, I have been searching for a spiritual master. I feel like I've come to the right place. Ravat's mood changed suddenly. In a commanding tone of voice, he instructed Chandranath to sit in front of him on the cot with his legs crossed in meditation posture. Then he proceeded to initiate him. When the initiation was completed, Prabhat took a piece of paper and wrote down the ten principles of Yama Niyama with brief explanations. He made sure that his new disciple understood them and then told him, Follow Yama Niyama very strictly. Let there be nothing in your conduct that can embarrass me. It is through the conduct of the disciple that one knows the Guru. Let your face always be illumined with spiritual light. After a brief conversation, during which Prabhat explained various aspects of spiritual practice and spiritual life, he asked Chandranath the following questions. Where does the soul come from? In what does it merge? Where does it remain when immersed in forgetfulness? When Chandranath could not answer the questions, Prabhat supplied the answers. The soul comes from the unqualified Brahma, gets involved in the qualified Brahma, and gets attached to the body when it becomes lost in Maya. When Chandranath was getting ready to leave, Prabhat added a few final words. Do as much spiritual practice as you can and serve all creatures of this world. Search for opportunities to serve the people. And remember the words of Tulsidas. When you came into the world, you were crying and the world was laughing. Live your life in such a way that when you leave this world, the world is weeping and you are laughing. Chandranath took Prabhat's words to heart. He began practicing his meditation with the utmost sincerity. Later that spring, Nagina Prasad Singha, a distant cousin of the same age, who worked for the Central Excise Department in Bagalpur, came to pay him a visit. When dinner was served, Nagina was surprised to see that while his close friend had served him his usual non-vegetarian fare, he himself was eating a vegetarian meal. When Nagina asked him why, Chandranath explained to him that he was now practicing meditation and yoga. Yogis recommended a vegetarian diet for those who wish to advance in the path of spirituality. Since meat and other non-vegetarian foods dulled the mind and incited the baser propensities. Chandranath had also given up smoking for the same reason. Nagina took this as a veiled reproach. He was a robust man, a former wrestler on his high school team, who enjoyed drinking, smoking, and the best European cuisine with the relish of a gourmet. Over the following months, he made a good nature attempt to convince Chandranath to give up this new fad, but he was unable to exert any influence over his resolute companion. In October, Chandranath came to Bagalpur and spent the night in Nagina's quarters. In the evening, Nagina took advantage of his cousin's visit to unburden himself. For the past several months, his boss had been doing his best to make his life miserable. Just that day, the situation had gone to the point where Nagina wasn't sure if he could tolerate it any longer. Chandranath listened patiently and consoled his friend. Finally, he told him, Nagina, I defy anyone to try and harm me. Even if God himself wanted to, he would have to think carefully about it. Then Chandranath excused himself. It was time for his evening meditation. He left his friend to ponder his words while he shut himself in Nagina's drawing room to meditate. When Chandranath was meditating, Nagina lay down on a cot in the next room and wondered what kind of force Chandranath had acquired that could make him feel ready to challenge even God. He knew very well that his lifelong friend was far too humble to exaggerate his own strength or utter even a single word of self-praise. As he was contemplating Chandranath's words, he began to see the image of a man gazing at him from within his mind. The man was short in stature, light skin, with his hair combed back, 
he wore black eyeglasses and the traditional white cotton dhoti and kurta, and his face glowed with a divine luster. Nagina soon found himself absorbed in the blissful vision. It was only when he heard his servant calling him that the spell was broken and the image dissolved. He was surprised to hear his servant say that dinner was served. Chandranath had been waiting for him for some time. He looked at his watch and was startled to see that two hours had passed. When the two men sat down to eat, Nagina started plying his companion with questions about his yogic practice. But Chandranath was less than forthcoming with his answers. When Nagina asked him if he had a guru, Chandranath told him that he had a master, but he was not permitted to say anything about him. Realizing that he would not get anything more from his friend, Nagina tried a different tack. He told Chandranath that he was going to describe someone and he wanted to see if Chandranath could tell who it was. Nagina then gave a detailed description of the man in his vision. Chandranath stared at him. A hint of annoyance crept into his voice. Why are you bothering me with so many questions about someone you obviously know so well? Nagina was surprised to see his suspicions confirmed. He went on to recount what had happened to him while Chandranath was meditating. Then he begged his friend to arrange for him to meet his master. I will do my best, Chandranath said. If the mere thought of a great man can provoke such changes in you, then once you receive his blessings and are under his protection, you will be capable of defying even God. When Nagina discovered that the master lived in Jamalpur, a scant two hours away by train, he insisted they leave immediately for the station to catch the night train. They could return in the morning after Nagina had gone initiation and the master's blessings. That won't be possible, Nagina, Chandranath told him. No one is allowed to know who the master is without his prior permission or where he lives. Then please, go and request permission for me. You are my friend and my relative. I know that you're going through difficult times. So I'll go to Jamalpur and present your petition. But I can assure you that you'll get a favorable reply. Some people wait for months, even years, to get his permission, and you want it right away, and his blessings as well. Nagina passed an anxious day at the office before Chandranath arrived back in Bagalpur the next evening and telephoned him from the station with the news that the master had given him permission to come for initiation. He had also sent him a message to face boldly whatever situation might arise. Everything would turn out well. That night, Chandranath nearly took Nagina's breath away when he told him that before he had even had an opportunity to present his petition, the master had said, So, you've come to talk about your friend Nagina. It was November 3 when Nagina reached Pravat's house. Stepping into the drawing room, he was overwhelmed when he saw the same effulgent face that he had seen in his vision. Pravat asked him to sit in front of him in lotus posture and then initiated him. By the time the initiation was finished, Nagina was experiencing back pain. He began to slump. Can't you sit straight? Pravat asked. I've been having back problems for a long time now. It's difficult for me to sit in this posture. Pravat closed his eyes for a moment. When he opened them, he said, Drink hot water and your pain will go away. After his initiation, Nagina wanted to know if it were necessary to be vegetarian to practice meditation and yoga. I don't know if I can live without eating meat, he said. Pravat smiled. It is better to be vegetarian. In fact, it is also better to give up onions and garlic. They have even more static properties than meat. But how can I give up eating meat? I just can't. Pravat laughed. Up until now, you have only thought about the best way to prepare meat. Perhaps you never even thought about the possibility that you could give it up. Just think about it and see whether or not you can. The path and process that I've shown you are very rational and logical, Pravat continued. Understand them properly, 
and practice accordingly. Sadhana, spiritual practice, is a must for human existence. But put it to the test. Question why you do it. If you understand the rationale behind it, you'll be more motivated and you'll enjoy it more. After Nagina returned to Bhagalpur, he disregarded Prabhat's instructions to drink hot water. Instead, he continued taking the medicines prescribed by his doctors. But his condition continued to deteriorate. Soon he was having difficulty breathing and had to take to his bed. He was unable to sit or walk without support. His bewildered doctors recommended that he go to Patna, the state capital, to take x-rays. Two weeks after his initiation, on a Saturday, Chandranath dropped by to see if he wanted to accompany him to Jamalpur on Sunday. Nagina was in no condition to go. He asked Chandranath to carry his salutations to the master and convey the message that since his initiation, he had not been able to sit down and do meditation properly due to the pain. Chandranath returned the next evening and wasted no time in confronting Nagina. Guru Deva told you to take hot water, but instead of following his instructions, you are taking all these medicines. That is going to end now. Chandranath gathered up the medicines that were lying on the night table beside the bed. He threw out those that had been open and asked Nagina's domestic servant to return the rest to the shop the following day. He then gave strict instructions to the servant and Nagina's wife that Nagina should only be served hot water. From that moment on, they gave him nothing but hot water to drink. When Nagina woke up the following morning, most of his pain was gone. Within a few days, it completely disappeared. With Nagina's initiation, the circle of disciples spread to the central excise department. Though Prabhat did not allow his disciples to disclose his identity without his permission, he told them that if anyone approached him with a sincere desire to learn spiritual practice, they can forward their name to him. If Prabhat approved, then they can give the person his name and address along with the time to come for initiation. Just as Shiva Shankar had brought Chandranath, Nagina now began bringing colleagues and friends of his. Shortly after Nagina's initiation, Chandranath was transferred to the BMP training center in Nathnagar, a suburb of Bhagalpur. His presence there had such an impact that soon the number of disciples in the BMP will be second only to those in the Jamalpur Railway Workshop. A few years later, Prabhat would say, only in half jest, that his favorite means of spreading his teachings was to get his disciples transferred. Thank you.